Welcome to part six of Crash Course Cryptography. My name is Julian, and today we're gonna talk about number theory and we dig a bit deeper. We've done a bit of an intro in one of the later episodes where we talked about sets and some modulus functions, and today we're gonna build on top of that, especially we're gonna be talking about finite fields and cyclic groups and why they are really relevant, especially when from the next episode on, we're gonna go into asymmetric cryptography. And this is gonna be actually key to understand how cryptocurrencies and blockchain works. I can highly recommend that you're watching some of the last episodes if you're quite new to the math and crypto stuff because it's gonna be really relevant. You understand that. And we're gonna dig right into it because it's gonna be quite fast and quite packed what we're gonna be discussing today. So let's get into our writing path and let's start with part six, number theory in detail. Now, I'm not gonna talk about the first one that's pretty much a set. We discussed this uh, before, which is nothing else than a, 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 a set of elements, uh, elements part of this set in no particular order, actually. Now, now we get into a more interesting part and we're gonna talk about a group. And a group is now where it gets very interesting. Basically defined, a group is nothing else then where two elements com get combined by a group operator. And obviously, the outcome has to be part of the group as well. So that's actually one of those four axioms. And so we have four axioms that define this. So this is a really easy definition. So we have now four axioms that apply to this group. So let's talk this through. So let's discuss these things. So elements are anything, basically it could be numbers. When we talk about um, elliptic curves, we're actually talking about points on a curve. So we keep this again quite general. But the first one is what's called closed or closure. And that basically means that the group operation is closed, right? So that's group operation is closed. So what this means is, very simple, if A, and we keep this again quite general, so I'll just make a little circle here. I don't make a, I don't make a plus or a multiplication, I just make a circle. Um, A group operation B equals C, and here's the important part, A, B, and C are all elements of G. Okay, this is the element, element sign here. So this is really important. So if I do this group operation, all these elements, A, B, and the outcome C must be part of the original group. So if we discuss this then later, you will understand that this is gonna be a very important one. So we can't go outside of the original group. Um, for example, if I go from one to 11, then, and I get an outcome that's 13, that's not part of the group, very straightforward. Okay, let's go to the second point, that's associativity. So, so, associativity. Associativity means that I can apply a group operation first to one part of the elements and then to the other one. So very simple one, if I have A, B, C equaling D in this case, sorry, let's, uh, let's um, not use D, let's make it very simple and say, I could do this operation first and then apply the next group operation to C, but it's actually the same thing as A, B, C, and I do the same thing here. Um, and to give you some very, very easy examples here, um, and I'm just gonna really, this is really, really basic example. So let's say uh, the group goes from, uh, in this case, let's say uh, two plus three equals five, right? And let's say all these elements are part of the group, so it would be fine. The same thing is here, if I would do two plus three plus four equals, so I could do those two first, so that's five plus four equals nine, right? So that's simple, so five plus four. Or I could do two plus three plus four, so I would have two plus seven. 
that's also nine. So it's the same thing. So that's associativity, just as a really simple example here, right? And I'm using the plus as, a, as an example of a group operation. Um, it could actually be the group operation. So then we have th uh, the third axiom, which is identity. Identity. Identity means that I have a neutral element and a neutral element and that neutral element has to be part of the group. And this now gets very, very, very interesting. Um, we're going to actually have, and when we talk about fields in the next step, then you will see how we're actually going to have an additive and a multiplicative um, element. Right now, let's just use one element, right? And let's just use um, the an element that is the additive um, neutral element, right? So let's use the simple one. So if I would use a times this, this element, right? And this is now gets really, really important. And in this case, let's use plus. Let's define it very, very simple. Plus equals a. Now here it's very, very simple, right? a plus zero is a. So here we have an additive uh, identity element. Now the other thing is when we do, let's use the multiplicative version. Very straightforward, a times one equals a, right? So that's the multiplicative identity element. And you will see why this is going to be important, um, especially when we talk about finite fields, right? So we need to have this neutral element, um, this identity element part of it. And then the last thing, and that's very important, is so-called invertibility. So invertibility means that I could, I, I have an, an, an element that I could do a times or a group operation, something equals one. Now, it, very, very easy if I would have five times what equals one. Very simple, it's just one fifth in this case, right? So the interesting thing that we see from this already is, and we're going to actually see this right in the next step, that all the natural numbers actually wouldn't work because I cannot use all the integers because this is not an integer. I can use all the rational numbers They would work. Integers wouldn't work because I cannot, I could not multiply five times an integer and get one. It would not work. So the same thing if I would use here, I'm using the multiplicative, but I could also use the additive. So this is the multiplicative inverse. I obviously could also use the additive inverse. So I could do five plus what equals zero? Well, it's very simple, minus five. So I have those group operations and I need to have an inverse to this entire thing, right? So that's gonna be very interesting. So here you will think, well, that's really easy actually, right? It's the zero, it's the one. Yeah, but you will see when we're talking about um, finite fields now, and we're going to be discussing all the modulus and add this there, suddenly it doesn't get so straightforward, right? So just stay with me and keep those four axioms uh, with yourself. Um, there's something what we could call, and there's a, a special form actually, let's just write this there. Um, that's a so-called abelian group. And basically what an abelian group means that A operation B equals B operation A. Right, so let's use five plus one equals one plus five. Quite straightforward. So let's get into the third part and let's talk about fields. And I kind of talked a bit about in groups already, so I kind of double did this already. But so basically fields just means that I have both of those invertibility options and I have both identity elements, right? So I have the additive and the multiplicative. 
And by doing so, I must have, very simple, I must have a plus function, I must have a minus function, I must have a multiplier, and I must have a division. And the division and the minus simply work by doing plus, in this case, let's say a negative number, right? Or I could multiply by a number minus one. So if I would write three minus one, this is actually one third, right? So it's something, so a times three minus one is a times one third. So I do have both options in division and in subtraction by using addition and by using multiplication. And this is very, 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 very straightforward so far, all right? So we have those axioms. We have closure, we have associativity, we have identity, we have the invertibility. In a group, we actually only have the additive. And now in the field, we also get the multiplicative. I just wanted to cover both because they kind of make sense here. And I just kind of want to explain this to you. In a field, we actually have all those four functions now. Now it gets very interesting. And so now we get into so-called finite fields. And this is something we need in all through cryptography. And this is very, very relevant. So how do we create these finite fields? And how do we have still these group functions? And how do we have that everything works in this finite field? And when we're talking about RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and then even crypt, uh, elliptic curves, you will see that this applies over and over again. And this is where stuff gets a bit crazy. So that's going to be very relevant. So what we have is we have actually this group, right? And so we, let's write it proper. It's actually this set with like two lines here. And we have this group and we take this group mod a prime number. You're used to this, right? So we always kind of create the cycle similar like we did with the clock. In the clock, we had these 12 letters, which is not accurate um, because this actually wouldn't properly work for a finite field because we need a prime here. And the reason we need a prime here is, and now remember, it gets very, very, very important. We need to have this identity element and we need to have the invertibility element. So let's look at the multiplicative, sorry, this is the additive here. Let's look at the multiplicative identity element. So let me ask you the following question, right? And let's do, and if you looked at the clock example, you saw that there, Actually, it was not possible to find a final element, the inverse. It's not possible. And here is an easy example. If I take, let's just use, 4 is one element, and I'm looking 4 times what equals, sorry, equals 1 mod 8. So by how much do I need to multiply the 4 mod 8 in order to get 1? And we can try this. And what we're going to find is, so 4 times 1 is 4, 4 times 2 is 8, four, uh, 12, 16, 20, 24, and so on and so on. So let's apply this. So 4 times 8 is 4, 0, 4, 0, 4, 0. So we never get to the one. We never. And the reason, and this is a really important rule, the greatest common denominator, GCD, and we're actually going to be discussing how to calculate that. You, you're going to use the Euclidean algorithm. But we're going to do this actually when we talk about RSA, because there we need it. But so the greatest common denominator between these, these numbers that we want to check here, so this number here and the modulus has to be one. If it's not one, it's impossible to find an inverse. So we couldn't find a number here that would bring us to one here. A different example, if we use, let's use a very simple example. So let's use a prime here, mod seven, and ask four times what equals one mod seven. And so here it's very simple. If we just go through here, this is four. Here we have the one already. Right? So 4 times 8 equals 1 mod 7. So here it gets very, very simple and very, very easy. So that's why we always use mod a prime here, because that way we can be sure that if we use 
ask about our inverse that we need to find here. And we're going to need to find these inverses in a lot, a lot of things. Um, you will see this. It's very, very important to have this there. All right? And so we could do the same thing for an additive um, inverse and for an additive neutral element. So let's go now and think this a bit further. So we talked about these fields. We talked about finite fields. So let's go into something because what we're going to find is Let's, let's just start an example, and then let's see what happens. So let's say we have a finite field, um, and let's say we want to check the finite field, and we look for the finite field of 11. And um, let's ask, let's, let's use the example a to the power of n mod n. Um, n is 11, so let's use a equals 3, and let's use n equals 11. And so what we're going to do is, um, and let's just skip the zero for now, right? Let's not uh, let's not do the zero, and I'll explain in a second why. So z to 11 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We don't include the 11. You will see why in a second. Actually, the uh, you can understand it right now. Zero and 11 are both zero. <laughs> it doesn't because the modulus is 11, right? So it's always zero. So let's look up these numbers here. So let's try um, and let's try three to the power of one. It doesn't matter what mod we take. It's three. Um, three to the power of two equals nine. So now it gets very interesting. Um, 3 to the power of 3 equals 27 mod 11. So that's 22 equals 5. So we have 3, 9, 5. Let's go further. 3 to the power of 4. Actually, we can use a shortcut here um, because it's a to the power of 3 times a. So that equals 5. We know this one already times 3. That's 15, so that's 4. So, so far we have the number 3, 9, 5, 4. Let's do another one. 3 to the power of 5 equals a to the power of 4 times a equals 4 times 3, that's 12, equals 1. And now it gets very interesting. Let's do another one. So, so far, if we do this and we do a to the power of n, where a is 3, and so that's the base, and we have n as the modulus, and uh, we actually go until n minus 1 here. Then let's look at the next one here. 3 to the power of 6 equals a to the power of 5 times a. 1 times 3 equals 3. And so now what happens is, we're getting back here. So it doesn't matter if we keep going. There's actually a lot of numbers that we never get to. We get to the 1. We don't get to a 2. We get to the 3. We get to the 4, to the 5. We don't see a 6. We don't see a 7. We don't see an 8. We don't see the 10. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 elements out of this group here where z11 mod 11. So we only get to the five elements. So in this entire group, we only have at the end five different results. And this is where something comes in that we're going to call cyclic groups. And cyclic groups are the fifth thing that we want to discuss. And they are very important. In cyclic groups, and this is now where it gets very important, order, and this is called the order, the order in this case of A equals the order of the group. So this is what a cyclic group is. Now remember, all the other things apply, right? We have the four axioms, all the things apply. So three 
is not a cyclic group in mod 11. It's not, because we only have an order of five. And here is a very interesting thing. So this is number theory. You can look up the proofs for this. We're just going to leave this aside. In cyclic groups, in this case, we could have an order of 10. We need to have an order of 10 in order to have a cyclic group because we have 10 elements, right? But so now these orders actually divide itself. So we have an order of 10, an order of 5, an order of 2, and an order of 1. So mod 11, 2 to the power of something, mod 11 is going to generate us a group with either 10 elements, 5 elements, 2, or 1. So the one element is a very, very straightforward one. If we look and say, for example, right, so this is a, a very easy one. <laughs> 1 to the power of n mod n. At the end, it always stays there. Because it doesn't matter how, how often I raise 1, it's always 1. Right? So 1, in this case, would give me one element, 1. That doesn't help us much. So there must be a, there must be a two to the power of something, mod 11, that's gonna generate us 10 elements. Because that's what a cyclic group is, where we have everything. And if we find an a to the power of n minus one, because we n to the 11 doesn't help us, mod n, where we get the full order of elements, right, where we get a cyclic group. We need to have the full order. This thing is many times described as an alpha, and that's a so-called primitive element or a generator point. And so you can have several generator points. And this is going to be relevant because you always want to have groups or fields with the maximum amount of elements. Because otherwise, you could have, you could run into this problem where here you think, man, I have 10 different elements in there. So I have a really large possibility of numbers. But then you only turn out with an order of five. And that's really dangerous. Think about if in Bitcoin, in theory, we could all choose from two to the power of 256 private keys. But then because the order is super small, we can only choose out of two to the power of 50. And this is like a fraction small, this would be hackable like this. And so in order to avoid this, we need to have a cyclic group where we have the maximum order. So let's look into an example of a real cyclic group because obviously three to the power of something mod 11 is not a cyclic group. So what would be a cyclic group? Let's try it out. Let's use again a, and we stop at one, uh, minus one mod n, and let's use a equals two. And two to the power of something is actually something that's very special. It's called a Galois field, Galois, Galois field, in honor of this mathematician who studied those things. And that is why, and you will see this, why we use two to the power all the time, because this is such a powerful um, tool, because it's very straightforward in generating or having cyclic groups. So two is a generator point, and we'll see why. Very simple, two to the power of one equals two, mod 11 always, right? So I don't write the mod 11, I just calculate that through. Two to the power of two equals four, two to the power of three equals eight. Now for the very first time, we need the 11, so that's 16. So that's five, we still have different elements. Two to the power of five is 32 times uh, mod 11 equals 32 equals 10. Two to the power of six, 64. 10 mod 11 equals nine. Two to the power of seven mod 11 equals seven. Power eight mod 11 equals three. We still don't have the same number. Two to the power of nine mod 11 equals six. Now it gets interesting. Two to the power of 10 is uh, 1024, mod 11 equals one. And now that's why we never include the zero and that's why we never include the 11 because it doesn't matter. 
it's the same thing anyways. 2 to the power of 11 equals that generator point. And this is something that's very important also in number theory, that if we use a generator point and we raise it to the order we get to 2, that's going to be something that's really, really important. Why is this important? Well, we gonna have we can have different uh, bases as well, or, or generator points. Um, actually, mod eleven. Um, remember, so if we use eleven, we can have here's the set. We take minus one, so eleven minus one. So we can have a group order of ten. That's the cyclic group. We have five, two, and one. So and I can write this up to you. Um, you can calculate this all yourself if you want. If we use one, then we have one, we discussed this. If So that's um, the uh, that's A and that's the order. Then if we use two, we have a cyclic group, so we get 10. If we use three, we tested this, we get five. If we use four, you get five. If we use five, we also get five. Now we get cyclic groups as well. Six equals 10, seven equals 10, 8 equals 10, 9 equals 5, and if we use 10 to the power mod 11, we get 2 different numbers. You can try this out if you want. Um, there's a lot, a lot of um, yeah, mathematicians that just tested this through, and so that's always the very important stuff. Now, again, this is what how we get to cyclic groups, and this is going to be really important to understand the basic concepts of how we got there. So let's kind of summarize all this, right? And I understand. When we talk about finite fields, we could go into irreducible polynomials. I understand that. We're not gonna talk about those because these are just proofs that these groups exist, right? That these finite fields exist. And I don't see the point in doing this here because here it's really about understanding basic number theory in order to understand all these cryptographic algorithms. But for those of you that understand this stuff or want to understand this stuff even deeper, you can. But it's not necessary to understand stuff like irreducible um, polynomials. So we talked about sets, we talked about a group, talked about the four axioms that define the group. And we always need this. We need this in cryptography all the time. From there, we actually get two fields where we don't only have one group operator, we actually have two plus and the multiplier. This is going to be relevant also when talking, talking about elliptic curves. From there, we get to finite fields by using a mod function and by important mod with a prime because we need to have the greatest common denominator here in order to have an inverse. Very important, and you're going to see this a lot, especially when talking about RSA inverses. Very, very important. right? And then we calculated this, and we realized, OK, there's an order. Just because we have a certain group uh, that's finite, um, in this case, mod 11, it doesn't mean we're going to generate 10 or 11 elements, right? So uh, yes, of course, we have the zero as well, but let's remove that. So yes, it doesn't mean because 3 to the power doesn't generate mod 11 all these different numbers. It generates only an order of 5. So we need to find what's called a generator point or a primitive element, which generates all the numbers. And that is then called a cyclic group. And cyclic groups are the basis in cryptography. They are the basis in elliptic curves. Because in elliptic curves, we have the same thing. They're the same thing as running around the clock. And this is important because we can have, in a group, we can have several primitive elements that generate a cyclic group. So here, in this case, we would have the two who would generate as a cyclic group. Uh, we would have, uh, sorry, I'm too far up here. Let's make a line here so I'm not getting confused. 2, 6, 7, and 8. And that's interesting because if I go from here, I go 11 steps, I always end up at the generator point. And this is interesting when we talk about elliptic curves as well because there you're going to think, huh, we're hopping all these points around a curve and if I would go all the way, the group order, wow, I would end up at the same point. And you need to understand that. That's very, very relevant, um, especially also when we talk about how these keys get developed and how you actually, very, very nice little topics. So I hope this makes sense. If you understand this, let me know in the comments. If you have any questions, then let me know. For those of you that are mathematicians that love to have proofs for all this, I understand. 
here, I'm gonna write this down. You could read or you can watch or read or whatever about irreducible polynomials. We're not gonna talk about those because then we're gonna take another polynomials. We're gonna talk, uh, we're gonna need another uh, half hour and it's not worth it, um, basically, as a proof that these finite fields exist. I hope this gives you value. This is your sixth step towards understanding crypto in real big depth. Looking forward to see you at the next episode. If you like what you see, give me a thumbs up, leave a positive comment in the comment section below, and uh, subscribe to the channel. See you at the next video. Yours truly, Julian.